everyone. Welcome to this YouTube channel. My name is Levi Kuzan, and today I am talking with Anthony Lewis. Hi, Anthony. How are you? Hello. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Today we're going to talk about primary directions, which is an old technique, a technique that's been used for thousands of years. Uh, it's a Hellenistic technique. It's quite involved. I'm interested in what it does, what we can expect from it. And I think it's important that we take it from the beginning. So it's going to be um, interesting. And, I'm, and I know you're, I mean, you've been using it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think you're the right person. So I, I don't know for sure exactly who originated it. It certainly yeah. occurs in the early Hellenistic literature. Kind it's of. become more popular because we now have computers that can quickly calculate it. So you don't yeah. have to think. <laughs> right. Of course, we have software to calculate these things, but I think as an astrologer, we also have the kind of the duty to understand what we're right. using. It's a, it's a vast topic, and so I'm going to try to keep it simple. I first became aware of primary directions early on when I began studying astrology. There were always references to it, and with this kind of awe, like it's we've lost this powerful technique and some people said it could be so exact you could pinpoint dates that things would happen. Yeah. Well, that's not true. It was not used that way. That's no. a myth that developed because people I think were, it was an ancient technique. So it had this mystique of being something very powerful and a, a secret that we'd lost hold of. And it was hard to calculate I mean, it really isn't that hard to calculate. Um, I understand that in the last few decades, people got more and more interested um, in using it after it had been maybe lost or not really lost, but maybe less in the public eye. It's actually one of the easiest techniques in astrology, the easiest to understand. The problem is because it's using measurements on the globe, which is a sphere. Yes. And because it's using the relation of the equator to the ecliptic, the path of the sun around the earth, and to the local horizon, you know, yes. where you are located. Uh -huh. You're using these three circles. There, there's an angle between each circle, and then you're measuring on the surface of the earth. So you have to measure using spherical geometry, spherical trigonometry, which is a yes. moderately complicated branch of mathematics, because unlike triangles on a plain sheet of paper, which are easy to to measure or work with because you're using standard trigonometry that we learn in high school. They're, the relationships are more complex on the sphere because everything is curved. Yes. Um, so the math gets a little more complicated. Not impossible. In fact, if you think back to it's, it originated probably a couple thousand years ago in the Hellenistic period. I'm not sure exactly who came up with the idea. But in that period, the main way of traveling long distances was by ship. And so yes. the sailors had to guide themselves by watching the stars and measuring where their ship was in relation to the stars. Mm -hmm. And that involved the same kind of measurements used in uh, primary directions. So sailors 2,000 years ago could probably do primary directions with very little problem because it was part of their daily life. <laughs> Exactly. To, to think of the sky and the earth that way. So it's the same, um, I think, about combustion and planetary war, which is also, you know, based on observational degrees. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, it's not on, based on ecliptic um, degrees. So, right. when, for example, planetary war is when two planets are within one degree, but it's not on in ecliptic uh, degrees, in ecliptic longitude, it means you know, projected on, onto the prime vertical, right. which is a part of your local space, right? And so it, right. that's also the reason why combustion was calculated um, just simply wrongly, or it was just much mm -hmm. easier to look at the ecliptic um, degrees. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, you know, the planets is really... Um, no, early astrology is very observational. They actually looked at the sky. <laughs> and so nowadays... A lot of astrologers have no idea what's going on in the sky. They just look yes. at their charts. Yes. So, but the basic idea, to go back, in the literature, I think the earliest references are the early Hellenistic writers like Dorotheus, who's first century, and Ptolemy, who's second century. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where it came from before that, I don't know. Uh, 
the idea was the, the Greeks probably inherited the, the Zodiac from the Babylonians or had a role in, mm -hmm. in, in conceptualizing it. They certainly mathematized it. They made it a very mathematical system with precise mathematical relationships. Mm -hmm. And they also, you know, we call Hellenistic astrology horoscopic astrology, meaning uh -huh. it's the astrology of the ascendant. Yeah. The ascending degree is the most essential point. And the idea is that's where anything that exists comes into being. Uh -huh. So it's very important to watch the ascendant of the chart and what's passing over the ascendant. Because whatever passes over the ascendant comes into being in your life or in the world. So that's the basic idea. So what Dorotheus did, he said that when you're born, there's a certain degree on the horizon of the zodiac. That's your ascendant degree. And in the hours after birth, the sky appears as the earth as the earth rotates the sky appears to turn in this clockwise direction if you're looking at the chart and so things that are below the horizon will slowly rise to the horizon and whatever one of those points below the horizon comes to the ascendant the horizon then that will manifest in your life because it symbolizes birth it symbolizes a new dawn the sunrise or the emergence of a new being or event in your life. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic idea that Dorotheus had. Is it possible to show that? The earth is turning this way, right? It's going from west to east. Mm -hmm. And this line in the middle is the, is the uh, equator. Yes. Okay. And the equator, as you can see, is tipped with respect to the sun. Mm -hmm. So that there's an angle of about 23 and a half degrees between where the sun is and where the equator's pointing. Yeah, which is creating the seasons. Right. Yeah. But, and we call that the ecliptic, the, the orbit of the earth around the sun and the orbit of the sun around the earth, depending on your point of view, is the ecliptic because mm -hmm. eclipses occur on that circle. Yes. So the earth is going around the sun, but the equator's always angled like this with respect to the sun. Yes. Mm -hmm. And let's say th this is the east. So as the earth turns, whatever you see in the east is rising for you. But it looks like the sky is turning. You're not aware the earth is turning. So whatever comes to this line here, this circle, is going to appear to rise. And when a star or planet gets there, then whatever it symbolizes comes into your life. You know. There's a, a program called Stellarium. Okay, so this is a set for my location. So currently, the sun is, the sun rose back here. I'm facing south because the ancient astrologers face south. East is oh. to the left, west is to the right. And there's two circles here. Well, as I face south, the line right down the middle is the meridian. That's the MC. Mm -hmm. So when the sun gets to this line, it's, that's noon at your location. Mm -hmm. And then there's two circles. This is the path of the sun. As you can see, the sun is rising and will set on this path. That's the ecliptic, yes. the orbit of the earth or the orbit of the sun around the earth from the geocentric point of view. This other line is the equator. So you can see there, they don't overlap and they're tilted with respect to one another 23 and a half degrees roughly. Mm -hmm. And this is where the equator crosses the ecliptic is the beginning of Libra here. Those yes. are the equinoctial points. And, and so we measure the tropical zodiac from these equinoctial points. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we could see below the earth, which I'll do in a minute. So here's the horizon still. Mm -hmm. And everybody has a different horizon. Yes. Exactly. Uh, and where I am, you can see Jupiter just came out of, came from below the horizon. Ju Jupiter just rose. Mm. So if I were doing primary directions, suppose I, I had a chart where Jupiter was just under the horizon. When Jupiter rose and crossed the horizon, 
I would expect Jupiter to manifest in my life. Okay? Yes. Now here you can see Venus is here, the sun is here, the star Spica is here. Eventually these points will get to the meridian, the midheaven. So when these points get to the midheaven, I would expect something to happen in my life, possibly related to my career, my public standing, and so on. Mm -hmm. if, we, if this was a birth chart we were looking at. Uh, now, the, the question is, how do we measure, let's take Venus. How do we measure when Venus will get to the midheaven? Well, you can measure it on the ecliptic because yeah. the, the planets no. go mm -hmm. along the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. But the ecliptic is harder to work with because it's skewed with respect to the equator. And the, the Earth is turning on its axis. So this is the circle the Earth is following as it turns. So the convention is we take the equator, this line here, and the North and South Pole are the center of this circle, the blue circle, and divide that into degrees, so the 360 degrees. And each of those degrees is called an equatorial degree because it's a degree on the equator. Uh -huh. And the measure we use, it's just called right ascension. So right ascension simply means the degree on the equator. So what, in primary directions, and probably the simplest primary direction is you look at the midheaven, because the midheaven is sort of secondary in importance to the ascendant. And you look at when a planet will get to the midheaven, but you measure how long it takes on the equator. And if you think about it, the time zones on Earth are measured along the equator. So every 15 degrees on the equator is one hour. Mm -hmm. right? So like you're in Belgium, I'm in the United States. There's, I think, six times, no, six hours between us. Right? Yeah, it's six, yeah. So, so it's like a 90 something. So, and that's each hour is 15 degrees, so six times 15. But time is measured on the equator because it's a uniform. The Earth turns uniformly. Every 24 hours, it makes a complete rotation. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I project Venus up here to the equator with a perpendicular. This, the line I use has to be perpendicular to the equator. Mm -hmm. That will give me the point that corresponds to Venus on the equator. And I see how long that point will take to get to the midheaven. And that's easy to do because this measure on the equator is a measure of time. It's called sidereal time because it's measured against the stars. So every 24 hours of sidereal time, the Earth makes a complete rotation. And, and so say, I don't know, I have no idea how long this is. Let's say this is two hours. I'm making that up. Mm -hmm. Then I know that in two hours, Venus will get to the midheaven. And each hour is 15 degrees, so that's 30 degrees. And then the Greeks use this measure. A degree on the equator is a year of life. So if this were my birth chart, at age 30, Venus would get to the midheaven. Maybe that would be the year I get married. All right, so one degree on the equator is one year of life is considered symbolically equivalent to one year of life but all right so we have the path of the earth i mean the earth spinning around its axis and then we have the ecliptic which is the path of the sun and right the path the ecliptic, uh, has, uh, travel along then we look at, you know, where these planets are on the ecliptic, and then we project that, those, onto the equator. Right, because but, mm -hmm. the, the projection onto the equator is called right ascension. And the projection is called right ascension, yes. Because, because mm -hmm. the degrees on the equator are in right ascension. This is only for mm -hmm. um, directions to the midheaven, because the midheaven is the noon point at local noon. The sun is exactly here on the midheaven. Yes, so that's the, it's the reference point. Right. Um, mm -hmm. 
Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the most visible point. So that would relate to something really right. becoming manifest in life. Right. Now, the other measure is called oblique ascension. And what that refers to, uh, let's take Jupiter again. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that Jupiter really is on the horizon here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little above it, but for the sake of argument, let's say Jupiter has just risen, it's on the horizon. Well, the right ascension of Jupiter, we draw a perpendicular line, would be right here. You see that? Mm -hmm. But oblique ascension simply means what degree of the equator is rising at the same time that Jupiter rises. Mm -hmm. So to look at is, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what rises at the same time as Jupiter. That's its oblique ascension. It's the point on the horizon that's rising with Jupiter, on the equator that's rising with Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And the right angle to the equator is called the right ascension because it's a right angle, right? <laughs> and so what is the difference between the two in terms of um, practical use? Okay, so the difference is if I want a primary direction to the mid heaven, the meridian, I'm going to use right ascension because of this is a right angle or we're going to the right angle. Yes. Mm -hmm. If I want to know when something comes to the ascendant, ascendant, I have to know when it rises, not when it's going to reach the mid heaven. Yes, obviously. So I'm going to use right ascension, this this degree over here. Yes, it's very clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that in primary directions, if you're measuring by right ascension, the right angle to the equator, you're measuring to the mid heaven. But if you want to measure to the horizon, you have to use oblique ascension because you want to know what what point right on the equator rises at the same time as the planet you're concerned about. And how do they actually, um, because it's an observational thing, mm -hmm. um, how do they do that? Uh, uh, what, what is, yeah. Glad you asked. <laughs> I just sure. put the constellations in, uh, but let's stick with, here's Jupiter, cool. right? It's just risen. So it's right ascension, I draw a line that makes a right angle up to the equator, that's the right ascension. And if I want to know when it will get to the mid heaven, I just time, when will this point get to this point? And oh. that's just the number of degrees on the equator tells me the time. Yeah, and so one degree per year. And then you also right. probably have to, I mean, you have to explain also why that is. Right, but the equator acts like a clock. That's Each 15 awesome. degrees on the equator is one time zone. So if I know 15 degrees have passed, I know one hour has passed. Yes. In real time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in symbolic time, 15 degrees would be 15 years. So there's real time and there's symbolic time. Mm -hmm. So right ascension, you draw the line that makes a right angle with the equator. That's the right ascension of the planet. And you use that to see when it will get to the midheaven. How far it is from the midheaven. Yeah. In that, degree, mm -hmm. right. So say that, say that's 40 degrees. I'm making up a number. Let's say it's 60 degrees we yeah. need to work with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 60 degrees, uh, each degree would be a year of life. So about age 60, this guy's going to have a great year <laughs> publicly. <laughs> it's out of his mid heaven, unless Jupiter's really afflicted. Yeah. Now, but Jupiter is not, there are two measures for Jupiter. There's actually three. Is Jupiter on the ecliptic is the common, when you look at a chart, you see Jupiter on the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. But we measure time on the equator. That's the key here. Why is that? Because the Earth turns one complete rotation every 24 hours. And the equator is exactly in the middle of the globe, so that as it turns, it's a very even movement. Every hour, exactly 15 degrees turns on the equator. It's like a clock. So the other measure for Jupiter here was the right ascension. The, the oblique ascension is this point over here, the point where when Jupiter rises, the point that's also rising on the equator, that's the oblique ascension. Yes. And so measures to see when something gets the ascendant, you have to know when it will rise to the ascendant. Well, it rises in oblique ascension. Mm -hmm. And that would be um, showing something coming to the per in the person's life, like for something example, a symbolically child. related to the ascendant, yeah. okay. the body, the motivation, whatever the ascendant means. Mm -hmm. The third measure 
is just on the ecliptic. But um, see, the tricky mathematics is switching back from the ecliptic to the equator and the two measures on the equator, right ascension and oblique ascension. But basically, you're talking about something on the ecliptic, right ascension on the equator, and then the oblique ascension, the oblique on the ascension which is horizon, where the horizon yeah. meets the equator. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and how do they actually measure these things? Um, you can measure it observationally, like if you had a sextant, and then there's a, the, the mathematics, you can calculate it if you know the, the, the proper parameters. As the earth moves, everything here will appear to rise. Now, what the ancients did is they used the zodiac. This is the sidereal zodiac, obviously. Here's Virgo, who's on the midheaven now. Uh, and what do we have rising down here? Leo's already descending, Virgo. Leo's got to be over here, right? The constellation. Yes. Mm -hmm. What they noticed was that some constellations took longer to rise than others. So there are signs of long ascension and signs of short ascension. Mm -hmm. Some signs rise very rapidly. Some signs take a long time to rise. And then they actually measured how long a sign of the zodiac took to rise in their location and made tables. So the ascension mm -hmm. times are for 30 degree segments. I don't know how long Libra took to rise, takes to rise here. It's a sign of long ascension. So mm -hmm. after Virgo, Libra would rise and Libra probably took a long time to rise. Maybe it took 40 minutes to rise. Why is that? Why is there different ascension times? Okay, because we're looking at it from our point on Earth, and we're not on the equator where everything would rise more evenly. We have this sort of skewed view. It's our, from our point of view. Yes. So from where I stand, this is my location, Libra is going to take a long time to rise. Yes. Nor, if it were a perfect system, every sign would rise in two hours, right? Because there's yes. 12 signs, 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. But some signs north of the equator are going to take longer to rise. Those are called signs of long ascension. Libra is going to take more than two hours to rise, as did Virgo. Mm -hmm. And it probably is going to represent 40 degrees, maybe. Because there's basically a difference between Earth space and zodiacal space. Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference in ascension times of the signs. One way and to this see depends it depends on your locality, obviously, because you it's all dependent on local space because it's all about observational degrees, right? Yeah. So one yeah. way to see it, let's can you you see this star here and this star here? Yes, I see Jupiter and Venus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's assume, for the sake of argument, this is not reality, that Jupiter and Venus, these two stars on the ecliptic, are the actual endpoints of a sign. Mm -hmm. is, let's assume this is 30 degrees. Then when I project Jupiter up to the equator, a line that's perpendicular to the equator here, mm -hmm. I'm going to make a line perpendicular to the equator here. And you can see that this space, I think you can see it, mm -hmm. is longer than this space. Yes, it's okay. This is very similar to projecting um, what the Vedic uh, astrologers did with on the prime vertical, you know, like the Campanus system. Yeah combustion and the Surya Siddhanta and um, Baraha Mihira they all did it like that and but they had this very important you know line a vertical line in their local space which is the prime vertical which is important because it runs through the nadir and the zenith and so on it goes to the east point and they projected their um, on you know the planets onto that a specific local line to calculate very important things i mean 70 percent of the vedic calculations astrology calculations are based on that so okay. this is very it's similar very sim yeah so mm -hmm. the point is if this is 30 degrees on the ecliptic which is the how big a sign is when we project it to the equator it's a bigger arc and the yes. equator measures how long things take its time oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so yeah. it takes longer to ascend because of this Oh, yes. the ecliptic, and when you're projecting, things stretch out. Exactly. exactly. So, normally this would be two hours from here to here, but then there's a little bit added, so maybe it's two and a half hours. 
Normally, this would be 30 degrees. When you project it out, this might be 40 degrees. Could it also be different? Could it also be in the reverse? Yeah. Uh, there are signs of long ascension and signs of short ascension. So, yeah, so it short means that would be over here, for instance. Suppose you went from the Libra point here to the moon. Mm -hmm. And then we project it down to the equator. It actually gets shorter. Yeah. This is a longer arc than this one because mm -hmm. I'm making a vertical line that's perpendicular to the equator. So yes. there are signs of long ascension and signs of short ascension. And it oh. depends on where you are on Earth because it's your yes your local uh, observational point. It's very interesting. It's very similar to what the, the Vedic guys were doing. But so to repeat, the basic idea is we normally work with the ecliptic to see where planets are in the sky because the planets go along the zodiac within a few, like eight or nine degrees of the path of the sun. Mm -hmm. The ecliptic runs in the middle of the zodiac. Right. Mm -hmm. But when we measure time, we measure it on the equator because the earth is rotating on its axis. The equator is exactly in the middle and it has this even motion. So we know exactly what time it is by where we are on the equator. You know, that's why we have the Greenwich Meridian and we measure time on Earth from the Greenwich Meridian. So I'm like five hours away from the Greenwich Meridian. Mm -hmm. So I, but that's with reference to the equator. So I know exactly what time it is anywhere on Earth with reference to, to Greenwich. Yep. Right ascension simply projecting a point on the ecliptic, or it doesn't have to necessarily be on the ecliptic. Let's take the star Arcturus. It's wow. not even near the ecliptic, but I can project that down to the equator and that will have a right ascension. It's just, it's coordinate on the equator. Oh yeah, like so, Pluto would be like really pretty far off, right? Um, well, speak is pretty much on the um, ecliptic, so it's... It is? Yeah, it's... Pluto? Right. Oh, Pluto, Pl I'm sorry. Yeah, Pluto. I thought you said speak of the planet. No, no, like Pluto. Oh, Pluto, you know, yeah. I don't see Pluto here, but yeah, Pluto usually has a, 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 yeah. a fairly great um, distance from the uh, Clip, uh, ecliptic. ecliptic. Yeah. Uh, what is but it? Um, any point can be have a reference point on the equator, like Arcturus would be this point here. Just draw a straight line down that's vertical to the equator, that's its right ascension. Sure. And so maybe this is 15 degrees, so at age. 15, whatever Arcturus means, will get to the midheaven and manifest in the life of this person. Mm -hmm. But if I want to measure with reference to the horizon, I have to use oblique ascension because right, right ascension has reference to the meridian, which makes a right angle to the horizon. Oblique ascension is the point on the equator that rises with a point on the ecliptic. The closer the planets are in latitude, mm -hmm. the, the more similar planets are in latitudes, celestial latitudes are relating to the ecliptic, the more it will be similar when they're projected onto the equator. Right. What happens is you get two sets of values. You get, let's see the moon here. The moon is usually about within five degrees of the ecliptic. Here the moon is above the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. So the, the right ascension of the moon would be maybe here. But if we project the moon onto the ecliptic, mm -hmm. we get a point that's a little different. And then we project that down here. So the right ascension of the moon, the body of the moon, is a little different in right ascension than the projection onto the ecliptic. That making sense? And now there's every planet, it's rare that a planet is actually on the ecliptic. Yes. Only the sun is always on the ecliptic. Yes. Mm -hmm. So every planet's going to have kind of two measurements. It's actual measurement in the sky, which takes into account where it really is, its latitude. Then there's a projection of that planet onto the ecliptic, which gives the points we see on the chart, the horoscope wheel. Mm -hmm. And usually a little bit apart. And so, for instance, Suppose, suppose the moon were down here and about to rise. Well, the body of the moon might come over the horizon before the ecliptic degree of the moon comes over the horizon. 
if the moon were over here below the horizon, the body of the moon would come over the horizon. You'd see the moon before its ecliptic measurement came to the horizon. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can get two sets of, um, this is what makes primary directions a little complicated because some people use just the ecliptic projection and some people use the actual body of the planet. Why the, would there be a difference? They're, they're basically coordinate systems. Well, here, let's take, for instance, here's Arcturus, okay? So if we projected Arcturus down to the ecliptic, it has to be a vertical line that makes a right angle with the ecliptic. We'd probably get to right here. You see that? Uh -huh. But the body of Arcturus is, if this were the horizon, would probably come up over the horizon after this point here because of the angle it makes with the ecliptic. Let me give you another example. Suppose you are driving your car and uh, you're going up a hill. And I want to know, when will you get to the top of the hill? Mm -hmm. So I'm on the other side of the hill. I'm going to see the top of your car first. Mm -hmm. Even though if I measured where your car was on the road, I'd probably measure where the tires hit the road. Mm -hmm. And where the tires hit the road would be below the top of the car. Mm -hmm. So the top of the car is what I see first. But if I only looked at the measure along the road, like where is this car on this road? It's mm -hmm. a measuring on the road itself, mm -hmm. where the tires hit the road. The point where the tire hits the road would be the last thing I would see to come over the hill. Yes, that's a very good analogy. Yeah, so that's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. There's where the planet really is and where its projection is on the ecliptic. Yes. There's usually some distance between them and one or the other will come over the hill first. Yes, or another analogy that occurs to me, suppose you're going up in an elevator to the fourth floor. And I say, where is where are you in the elevator where you're in the very middle of the elevator, but I measure, I draw, I draw, I draw an outline of your shoe to put your location. Mm -hmm. And the base of the elevator is the ecliptic, mm -hmm. but your head is going to come first to the fourth floor before your foot does, mm -hmm. even though I'm using your foot to give sure. your location. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the basic idea. So here's the coordinate system. Here's the horizon, right? Mm -hmm. And the horizon varies with your location on Earth. Everybody has a different horizon if they're mm -hmm. in a different place. So from where I am, when I look out, things below the green line, I can't see. They're below the horizon. Mm -hmm. Things above the, the green line, I can't see. There's a sun. It's almost noon here. So the sun is almost on the midheaven. Mm -hmm. uh, here's Saturn, okay? Saturn is below the horizon. Now, at some point, Saturn is going to rise and cross the horizon. Mm -hmm. So the primary direction of Saturn to the ascendant is this line here on the ecliptic. But if I want to measure the time, I have to figure out what time Saturn will actually get to the horizon. What time will Saturn rise? Mm -hmm. And I do that by projecting to the equator. So I draw a vertical line from Saturn to the equator. When will Saturn rise? Well, the ascendant is here. E stands for east here. Mm -hmm. The east point of the equator on my horizon is right there. When will Saturn get to here? Mm -hmm. I have to measure this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have to see when Saturn itself will get to here and measure this arc and that will tell me the age at which Saturn will manifest. And as you can see, this part of the zodiac from Libra, this is going to go down to uh, Aries on the other side. These signs are going to take longer to rise than these signs over here, because the time is measured on the equator. Well, if you start here at Libra, and you can see if Libra is this distance here, say it's from here to here to Venus is Libra, mm -hmm. then this is a bigger arc up here yes. on the equator projecting. But we're, I think we're going over too many concepts at once. It's, it's a very simple idea. When will a planet get to the horizon, oblique ascension? When will a planet get to midheaven, right ascension? 
we take those measures on the equator, convert them to years, and we have the event. The problem occurs when you're working with two points in between. So say here's Jupiter and here's Venus. When will Jupiter get to Venus? Well, that's a little more difficult because you can't really use oblique ascension. That's just for when things rise. You can't really use right ascension. That's for when things get to the midheaven. Uh -huh. And these are intermediate. So what Ptolemy did, he said, was, well, each planet, has a certain amount of time it takes to get from the horizon to the midheaven. Yes, yes, makes uh, sense. Mm -hmm. And so let's just do it proportionately. Suppose mm -hmm. Venus took, takes six hours to get from the horizon to the midheaven. So every two hours is a third of the way. Mm -hmm. And suppose Jupiter takes nine hours. I'm making these numbers up. Mm -hmm. So every three hours it gets a third of the way. Mm -hmm. So when Jupiter has gone three hours, it's equivalent to when, Ju when Venus has gone two hours. Mm -hmm. So if I can figure out how long will it take Jupiter to get to this point where Venus is in its own orbit, path around the, the Earth, uh, yes. and use a proportion, this is called a Ptolemy's proportional method, mm -hmm. then, then I'll call that a conjunction of Jupiter to Venus. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, yeah, that would be interesting to see when these points conjunct to certain um, right. yeah, planets. Or to use the road analogy, suppose I have an old car that goes slow, so it takes me a long time to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. and you have a, a brand new car that goes fast. Well, you're going you're gonna to cover the same distance in much less time. Yes. So yes. if I want to know when we'll be at the same point, it will take me longer to get to the same point than it did you. But if it took me five hours and you three hours, though we would be conjunct if I've traveled five hours and you've traveled three hours. Mm -hmm. And we would sure. call that a conjunction. Okay. So that's Ptolemy's idea. I hope that. That's clear. very clear. I also I would just like to go back, um, Anthony, to what you were saying between in, in with respect to the signs and their um, different ascension times. You said here the the west part there uh, of the chart, you know, um, with the moon there and so on. These constellations will um, rise faster than the others, the other side of the meridian yeah. there. So yeah, why is that exactly? It's because the signs are measured in 30 degree segments on the ecliptic, which is this yellow line, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But the time that they take to rise is measured on the equator, which is the blue line. Mm -hmm. And so to figure out how long it takes something to rise, we have to project the ecliptic onto the equator. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, mm -hmm. the ecliptic, let's just take this from the meridian to the uh, horizon, the segment of the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. So I'm going from the green line, the horizon, up to the green line here, the meridian. This is the, uh, this is the segment of the ecliptic. How long will it take for this segment of the ecliptic to rise? We, have, yes. we measure time by this blue line uh -huh. on the horizon. Well, the blue line is a lot longer than the, green, the yellow line. Do you see that? Yes. Uh -huh. From E here, east, up to the meridian is the time it takes for this segment to rise. That's a long time because it's a bigger arc. Wow. Here's the amount of the ecliptic that rose in that period. Yes. So the, whatever is going on here on the ecliptic takes a long time to rise. Mm -hmm. But if we look mm -hmm. over here, say, from Libra down to the horizon, Mm -hmm. That's a big segment of the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. But how much time does it All take? Right. It takes this little segment to rise. It's All right. The mm -hmm. blue is the time, the amount of time. The yellow is what's actually rising. So yes. this rises really fast, this segment, compared to this segment over here, which rises a lot more s slowly. So these are called long ascension, they take a long time. Short ascension, they take a short time. The equator. And the ecliptic are fixed circles in the sky. What changes is the horizon. So where yes. you are on Earth makes yes. a big difference because if the horizon's down here, say, 
Or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's going to reverse things. So I just switched us to Africa. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, uh, the sky doesn't look at all f familiar to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, no, here's Virgo down here now. Okay, it's interesting. Because we, we moved across the ocean. Remember, at my location, Virgo was on the midheaven. Mm -hmm. Now Virgo has just set. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was at sunrise. Now we're at sunset. Uh, trying to make this a little more even. And here is Libra, the crossing of the ecliptic and the equator. So as you can see, these circles stay fixed. They're, they're, they're fixed in space. What yes. changed is the horizon. Mm, yes, exactly. And, and but still mm -hmm. things are so... so yeah, so in respect to the rising um, right. times. So here's Pisces and Aries. This part of the sky is constellations are rising. Mm -hmm. And um, But if you look at, if we take Aries down to the horizon here in Africa, this mm -hmm. is on the ecliptic. This is a fairly long stretch compared with the time measured on the equator. So these are sh signs of short yes. ascension because yes. they rise quickly. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. so yes. if you're looking over here and you see, you know, the fish in the sky, the constellation, that's going to rise very quickly, less than two hours. All right. So if you want to know your ascension times, you have to look them up because it was right. going to be very particular and dependent upon your, obviously, upon your locale. Yeah. Well, what, what the ancients did is they very carefully observed the heavens from their location, which was probably Alexandria, Egypt, and that area. Mm -hmm. And they made tables, like we have ephemeris, you know, tables of ascension times. So they knew for their location how long each sign would take to rise. And okay. they used those tables to figure out uh, primary directions when they would manifest. Let's look at the globe again. Can sure. you see it? So it's turning from west to east. Here's the equator. And the, the sun is out here. So as you can see, if my hand is the sun, as the earth turns, the path of the sun will... Cross the equator. So that's the reason. Cross the equator at Aries and Libra. Zero Aries Libra. and Libra. Equinoxes. Oh, yes. That was a very good move. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But we measure time on the equator because if we put it this way, here's the North Pole, here's the mm -hmm. South Pole. And as the Earth spins, this circle spins exact evenly. It's right in the middle. So every 15 degrees is an hour on this circle on the equator. Mm -hmm. And that's why we use the Greenwich Meridian at distance from the measure, Greenwich Meridian measured along the equator to set the time zones. Why do we use the, the Greenwich Meridian? That's a convention. That's a convention, right? Yes. Yeah, I think exactly. in ancient India it was... Yamakoti or something. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just a convention because the British sailed a lot and they set, they got to choose. <laughs> in modern mm -hmm. times. But... But the point is, if you just keep the Earth vertical, as the Earth turns, the equator, it's in kind of invariant. It's always, it moves at this very even rate, one rotation every 24 hours, mm -hmm. 15 degrees every hour. And so we can tell time if we know where the equator is with reference to the stars. We know what time it is. 24 hours with reference to the stars is one rotation of the Earth. And so... We always measure time on the equator. I'm here at the eastern United States, mm -hmm. and you're here in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So there's yes. six, six hours between us. If I knew your exact longitude, I'd subtract it from mine. Do you know your longitude? Three east, 48. Three east, 48. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's call that four east. And I'm 73 yes. west. So what is 77 divided by 15? Yeah, a little more than five. Right, so we're five time zones apart. But if I know your time, wherever you're over here, and then I just go along the equator, eastward 73 degrees, 
I'm going to get to where I am. Okay. So yes. time is measured on the equator. That's the basic idea. Time is measured on the equator. Yes. I was thinking if you put the earth like that, you know, if it, the earth loses its tilt, then there, there wouldn't be seasons. That's the whole point, right? Because right, right. the day the sunrise would be yeah. every day exactly the same thing right. everywhere. But it was an observational science. It is an observational science. It is, yes. But mm -hmm. If they wonder when things happen, they measured along the equator. And we measure time because you know, the, the North Pole to the South Pole is, is what the Earth rotates on. And the, the, and the only Earth. circle that moves evenly, great circle, is the equator. Yes. If we use a different circle, we'd have this, this skew, right? Skew, yes. Mm -hmm. Some places, the, the hours would be longer than others. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you do planetary hours, that's what happens. Some hours are bigger than others. Right? Planetary <laughs> hours, basically, you, you take how long the sun is in the sky during the day, divide it by 12. Those are the 12 planetary hours. But they may have different lengths than the night hours. Like mm -hmm. the sun is... 10 hours above the horizon, then it must be 14 hours below the horizon. Mm -hmm. And dividing 10 by 12 gives you a smaller number than dividing 14 by 12. So the daytime hours are shorter than the nighttime hours. Primary directions are a very old and very simple method in astrology of prediction. And the idea is that the most important point in the chart is the ascendant which is the point on the ecliptic that's rising on the horizon when you're born. Mm -hmm. And that's where things come into your life. The other key point in the chart is the midheaven, which is where the sun is at noon, local noon, because that represents your public status and career and reputation. So when planets come to those two points as the earth rotates, you expect important things to go on in your life. And measurements to the midheaven, the meridian, are done in right ascension. You take a line from the planet or point to the vertically to the equator so that it makes a right angle with the equator. That's the right ascension of that point and see when that will reach the midheaven. For the horizon, it's different because you're measuring to the horizon. And the horizon is a local phenomenon. It depends where you are on Earth. Everyone has a different horizon unless you're in the same location. Mm -hmm. So that's measured in mm -hmm. oblique ascension okay. because really the oblique ascension is what point on the equator is rising at the same time as the point you're thinking about. Yes. It's basically co a co-rising idea. What yes. point rises at the same time as the planet? What point on the equator rises at the same time? Time is the planet. And you measure in oblique ascension from the ascendant, because it's where things rise to, to measure time. Yes. And then intermediate points, Ptolemy used this proportion depending on how, how long it takes the planet to rise, culminate, and set the so-called daily arc of the planet. And when they were at proportional distances from the ascendant and midheaven, they were considered conjunct. Okay. That's very clear. I'm yeah. very excited. I think a lot of people will be very happy with yeah. this. Um, yeah. Nice, clear explanation. Also, uh, vi very visually ma made very clear visually. Very right. Yeah. And so the ideas I think are pretty clear cut, relatively simple, and very visual because they're based on observation. When yes. you try to do the math, it gets a little more complicated because you have to work with spherical geometry instead of plane geometry. And the, the basic idea is the ascendant is key. When, so, when will something come into my life it, when it affects my ascendant? <laughs> sure. And also, well, if you know the ascendant, then you also know the descendant. And so that's going to have a right. similar same, same for the... Yeah. And if you know the location and the ascendant, you know the midheaven, the meridian. Did you do the math yourself? I mean, did you... Because I I know you're into math. I mean, you have a, a master's in, in or a major in math. Well, um, now I rely on the computer, <laughs> but I have in the past done the math. You did, yeah. You calculated it. And this was before computers. I had to use tables of logarithms to compute uh, trigonometric functions. I guess it's a good exercise, anyway. It's like doing um, a horoscope, but 
by hand. But a nice thing about the technique is even with the ecliptic chart that we normally use, mm -hmm. you can eyeball a chart and get a sense of when things will happen. Maybe I'll just go quickly. This shows you the different reference systems. <laughs> so here's the ecliptic, the red line. You can see the sun moving around mm -hmm. and the signs of the zodiac. Here's the equator. There's the North and South Pole. So the Earth is turning this way, and we use the equator to measure time. And this horizontal line is the horizon that varies with where you are on Earth. Mm -hmm. And so these are the three circles that we have to juggle to make the calculations. Yes. And yes. that's why it gets a little complicated. It was the major predictive technique for probably the first 1,500 years uh, since it was invented. I mean, it was used from Dorothea's first century through the Middle Ages and Renaissance. No, through the Renaissance. Lily used it, and he was 17th century. So we're talking about maybe 1,700 years of use, reliable use. It was used reliably to make predictions. Say Jupiter is in my first house, five degrees inside my, below my ascendant. So I look at the sky and I say, I can see when Jupiter rises. I can just see it. Well, how long did that take? That's when it's going to manifest in my life.